What would I say if I could talk to my friends who are still Jehovah's Witnesses? That's a question I've asked myself over this past year a lot. As many of you know, I disassociated back in March of last year. The last meeting I attended was back in December of 2017, which was the last time I saw many of the people I grew up with and were surrounded with my entire life. Men and women, or brothers and sisters as I used to call them, of all different ages. But now one thing was they were all sharing in common. And that was, based off Watchtower policy, they no longer could have anything to do with me. They would now shun me as a disfellowship one. But if I had one opportunity to talk to my friends, what would I say? Would they even listen to a word I had to say? I would hope that our friendship and all the things we went through would give me one chance to say what I needed to say. To tell them I cherish their friendship and how much I wish we could continue being friends now and in the future. But I know it's not that easy. So, instead, I wanted to make this video. And rather than me just unloading all of my feelings and thoughts all at once, instead I wanted to begin by asking everyone who's a Jehovah's Witness watching this video to ask themselves three questions. And after you answer them, I'll list my answers and why I feel the way I do. So, take a second and really think about these upcoming questions. If you need to pause the video and come back, that's encouraged. So, the first question is, why are you a Jehovah's Witness in the first place? Second question, how do you know you have the truth? And finally, this one's kind of like a two-parter. What if you're wrong? And how would you even know if you're wrong? Now, I really do hope that you've given enough time to step away and think about these things and give them proper thought. Give them real answers that are personal to you that you are happy with. Now, we're going to take a look at them one by one by using my own personal experience as the template for the answers, and then afterward I'm going to do a little bit of a background as to why I felt that way and how I feel now. The first question, why did I become a Jehovah's Witness? I've answered this before in previous videos, but to sum it up, my mom began studying when I was about four years old, and she believed it was the one and only truth. She raised me to believe God was real and that his name was Jehovah that mankind was sinful and needed a sacrifice to get back on the road to redemption by means of Jesus. Basically, I was taught it was the truth without ever being shown other viewpoints or belief systems. I was told that we were lucky to have even come to have known it. And really, when I think about it, what I really appreciate about what I learned and ultimately why I decided to get baptized was that there was a convenient answer for just about every question I could think of. Why are we here? God created man in his image. What is mankind's purpose? To worship Jehovah and to live happily lives on a paradise earth. Why is the world the way it is? Well, Adam sinned and thus humans need time to show that they can't govern themselves. What happens to us after we die? Well, we simply fall asleep and can be remembered in God's memory, ready to be resurrected in the future if we live faithfully to Jehovah. Basically, it was like doing a maze puzzle with all of life's great mysteries but with all of the solutions already filled in. And then told that if I took an alternate route, that all these horrible things would happen to me. Not to mention that I was taught to believe there wasn't much time left in the world, since we were so close to Armageddon. All in all, it just made sense, and so there really wasn't any room to question anything. And, I mean, come on, let's face it. You know, we're not raised as Jehovah's Witnesses to ask questions at the meeting. I mean, I was raised to underline and find the answers that are already provided for you in the publications. So, there simply was no room to think critically or to investigate concerns or doubts outside of what was given to me by the organization. And going along with that, to me, people in the world, including my non-witness family, they were people I felt sorry for, since they didn't have like a hope for the future. The world was out of control and getting worse by the day, and they had no idea why it was happening or what was going to happen to them if they didn't change their ways. But now, here's where things start to open up for me. Rereading scriptures like Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 5, opened my eyes to things that were right in front of me the whole time. And it reads, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. After that, God saw that the light was good, and God began to divide the light from the darkness. God called the light day, but the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, a first day. So he creates light in a division between day and night on the first creative day. So now let's skip over to uh, verses 14 through 19. And it reads, Then God said, Let there be luminaries in the expanse of the heavens to make a division between the day and the night, and they will serve as signs for seasons and for days and years. 
They will serve as luminaries in the expanse of the heavens to shine upon the earth. And it was so. And God went on to make the two great luminaries, the greater luminary for dominating the day, the lesser luminary for dominating the night, and also the stars. Thus God put them in the expanse of the heavens to shine upon the earth, and to dominate by day and by night, and to make a division between the light and the darkness. And then God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a fourth day. So, <clears throat> he creates the sun and the moon for the earth on the fourth day. But which one is it? Did he create the concept of light on day one throughout the entire universe? But what about night and day? Different planets have different cycles of night and day, and some are constantly in darkness. That doesn't make much sense, since it says he creates Earth in the first day, and we know that Earth is nowhere near as old as the universe. So, let's just let that sink in for a moment. Now, I remember in the Awake magazines there would be articles about animals and insects, and what we can learn from them can help us to get an insight into the way that Jehovah thinks. So then I started to think, what can I learn from the spider wasp, who inserts her egg sac into a living spider, and then has its young eat the spider from the inside out while it's still alive. What can I learn about Jehovah from that? Or how about the brain-eating amoeba? Because if we are to believe that Jehovah created everything according to its kind, then why would he create an organism that swims through a person's body and up to its brain to then eat it from the inside out? Speaking of, according to their kind, how did Noah get every type of dog on the ark? I've heard brothers tell me that they just needed to bring one pair of wolves and we could breed out the rest. However, if you just keep breeding wolves with wolves, all you will get is wolves, which is why they still exist now. So where did the rest come from? Where did chihuahuas come from? On the subject of Noah, how did the kangaroo jump itself across the Indian Ocean, get on the ark, then hop across the ocean again, all without leaving so much as a single fossil or having babies along its way back home? And there's this weird one. If we were created perfectly, then why do we even have an immune system? What about wisdom teeth? Once I allowed myself to do research on my own, everything just opened up one after the other. When the Watchtower's answers were no longer satisfying to me, I find out that a lot of what I had been taught was either misleading, biased, or seemingly wrong on purpose despite what science has discovered. A really big glaring one that hit home for me was that for as long as I could remember, I was told we were living in the last days, and that these last days were the worst in human history, and would continue to progress towards badness until Armageddon happened. Matthew chapter 24, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be food shortages and earthquakes in one place after another. All these things are a beginning of pangs of distress. Earthquakes, wars, food shortages, so on. However, I then decided to compare that to all the people working in these fields who have studied all their lives to report on these things, and I found a much different story. In a convention years ago, they said that we were in the last seconds of the last minutes of the last hour of the last days. That was said when I was 14. I'm more than double that age now, and the meetings are still saying that, including back in 2017 when I last attended meetings. They'd question, how can we live in times even worse than now? Things are worse than ever. But let me show you something interesting. Let's read an excerpt from the 1894 Zion's Watchtower, July edition, page 226. And it reads, The old is quickly passing and the new is coming in. Now, in view of recent labor troubles and threatened anarchy, our readers are writing to know if there may be, may not, if there may be not a mistake in the 1914 date. They say that they do not see how present conditions can hold out so long under the strain. We see no reason for changing the figures, nor could we change them if we would. They are, we believe, God's dates, not ours. 
But bear in mind that the end of 1914 is not the date for the beginning, but for the end of the time of trouble. We see no reason for changing from our opinion expressed in the view presented in the Watchtower of January 15th, 1892. We advise that it be read again. Kind of a shock to read that sort of stuff, right? For all my life, I was taught that early Bible students had always said that 1914 was going to be when Jesus took over the kingdom and that it was the beginning of the last days. And yet we read the complete opposite. They were teaching and preaching to people that the end was near and that conditions on the earth just simply couldn't get any worse. 1914 was clearly predicted to be the end of the days of trouble. So there was a mad dash to get as many people in as possible. But the year came and it went. Nothing. Now, if you're a witness, then I know what you're thinking. Well, this was written in the 1800s. This was before they were chosen and inspected by Jesus in 1919. So if it's before 1919, then yeah, they could get some things wrong. Okay, I can see that line of reasoning. So, let's now read a publication from 1924, which would be during the time Jehovah had already chosen them as his earthly organization. And it reads... The date 1925 is even more distinctly indicated by the scriptures because it is fixed by the law God gave to Israel. Viewing the present situation in Europe, one wonders how it will be possible to hold back the explosion much longer. And that even before 1925, the great crisis will be reached and probably passed. The present conditions are strengthening to the faith of the Christian. His heart groans with others of the groaning creation anxious to see the Prince of Peace bring order out of chaos and blessings to the people. In modern teachings, 1919 is the date that witnesses solidified their role as God's true earthly organization. And from then on, they would be getting spiritual food and being blessed by Jesus, Jehovah, so on. However, how is it that immediately after they've been chosen, they begin teaching erroneous things? They're telling people in their publications the world is going to end in 1925, and yet here is evidence today that it did not happen from their own publications. Many people joined thinking conditions were at their limit and wanted to make a hope for themselves. Doesn't that sound familiar? We've been told to endure like a runner for as long as I can remember, but I thought it was because we were a special case, a special group in the last days who were about to finish the race. But little did I know that this is the same message that Watchtower has been repeating over and over throughout the past century and a half. And yet people did the same in 1975, though modern witnesses would feel that they were stupid or misled by their own eagerness, as was brought out in a recent video that was shown at a convention. You see, back then, some were looking to a certain date as signifying the end of this old system of things. A few even went so far as selling their homes and quitting their jobs. I admit, I was ready to see this old system go away too. But something just didn't seem right. Just like a runner when he's running a course and he gets near to the end, just about the time when he thinks he just can't go in and on any further, he realizes, well, there's the go-ahead of it. He's come around the last lap and there it is. Well, all of a sudden he just seems to get some reserve power from nowhere and with a sudden surge of energy on he goes to break the finish line rope and win the prize. Well now, as Jehovah's Witnesses, as runners, even though some of us have become a little weary, it almost seems as though Jehovah has provided meat in due season because he's held up before all of us a new goal, a new year, something to reach out for, and it just seems it's given all of us so much more energy and power in this final burst of speed to the finish line. And that's the year 1975. There's been a lot of talk about the year. In fact, even this week, some individuals have uh, been wondering, well, what does it mean? Or do we dare talk about it? Uh, uh, is it something we can discuss among ourselves, even though we might talk, not talk about it too much in public? Do we really know what it means? Well, we don't have to guess what the year 1975 means. If we read the Watchtower, because the Watchtower has been very explicit as to what the year 1975 means for us. But as you just saw, 
Here was Brother Charles C. Nutko, I think that's how you say it, a former circuit overseer at a convention painting a completely different version of history. There's not much needed to be said after that. When you say something and it doesn't come true, it just means you're wrong. It doesn't mean you change the narrative to make it sound like you always had the truth. Imagine someone witnessing a crime on the street and he's brought in to testify. However, when the questioning begins, he says one story, but then later on changes it. Wouldn't he be seen as a liar? Now, how much more so should an organization who are saying it means your everlasting life, plus they have the control of the lives of millions of people around the world, they should be held accountable for the false predictions they've made that have hurt the lives of people the world over. I don't think anything can bring it home stronger than this scripture in Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 through 22. If any prophet presumptuously speaks a word in my name that I did not command him to speak or speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet must die. However, you must say in your heart, how will we know that Jehovah has not spoken the word? When the prophet speaks in the name of Jehovah and the word is not fulfilled or does not come true, then Jehovah did not speak that word. The prophet spoke it presumptuously. You should not fear him. And so now, in our current time, when the generation that would not pass, well, passed, they had to scramble to find a clarification because 1914 could simply not be wrong. Even though in earlier books they were saying 1925 had much more evidence and was much more important than 1914. In the July 15, 1924 Watchtower, this is what was said. The year 1925 is a date definitely and clearly marked in the scriptures, even more clearly than that of 1914. I'm sorry, what? In my entire almost 30 years of being a witness, I had never even knew 1925 was seen as some special year. And this older Watchtower claims it has even more significance than 1914? Yes. This is the type of organization that we're dealing with. And why do we not know about this? Well, when 1925 came and went, they were wrong. And so they had to rethink another explanation. They had to rethink the entire basis upon witnesses calling themselves the chosen organization of God. If they're wrong about 1914, then they're wrong about everything. If 1914 doesn't happen, then 1919 doesn't happen. And if that doesn't happen, there's nothing they can point to to say they're God's organization. In terms of more recent publications, my mom studied the Revelation book back in the early 90s, and she points to that for giving her faith that the witnesses had things right, since she could see the earthly climate falling in line with what they were writing. However, today, in 2019, the Revelation book is seen as one of those old light publications. It is full of holes and changes and clarifications. So my question then is, how could Jehovah and Jesus allow such a book full of so many mistakes be written in the first place if in 30 years it was going to be basically made obsolete? In a sense, everything they taught from that book was wrong. So where was the Holy Spirit there? We can then say the same about all the publications that have had clarifications and required changes. And so from there, it all starts to go back to why I became baptized. Like, Why did I want to become a Jehovah's Witness? because I didn't know any of this. What I was taught was that in the Bible, we are told that Jehovah never changes. And so his word never should as well either. To illustrate, let's say the Bible is a perfect work. It was written by God using imperfect men by Holy Spirit to jot down his thoughts. But even though he used imperfect men, it is still considered perfect. There's nothing incorrect in the scriptures according to Bible readers, right? It's a message that should stand for all time. Now let's fast forward to our modern day where all the final day prophecies are due to occur. We're living in the last days, and the end is due to come within our lifetime. And there are only 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide. That means, according to Watchtower teachings, all non-JWs will be killed in the Battle of Armageddon. With the world's population at close to 8 billion, that means that 99.9% .9 of mankind will be killed and slaughtered when the end comes. So to get this straight, at the most crucial moment, of mankind's entire existence on the eve of them about to be completely obliterated, why would the truth continue to require being clarified? If it's the truth, it's the truth. If the Bible can stick to its pages and never change, then why is God's hand-chosen organization constantly playing catch-up and needing to clarify and revise understandings this far into the end? 
Undoubtedly, witnesses will quote Proverbs 4, verse 18. But the path of the righteous is like the bright morning light that grows brighter and brighter until full daylight. Well, I would suggest to go back and read the entire chapter and tell me where does it reference or even make mention of anything that has anything to do with the modern time. If it somehow does, go and watch the broadcast with governing body David Splain, where he says that the current Watchtower Authority will no longer use types and anti-type methods when writing or looking at scriptures meaning that they will not look at scriptures and then try to find a correlating event in the future to tie it all together. In recent years, the trend in our publications has been to look for the practical application of Bible events and not for types where the scriptures themselves do not clearly identify them as such. He literally says they don't want to go beyond what was written. We simply cannot go beyond what is written. So all of this is something to think about. I didn't know any of this when I decided to go under the water and become a Jehovah's Witness. Had I known any of it, I would have thought the entire thing was wrong from the get-go, and it would have saved me so many headaches. So now we're on to the second question. How did I know the truth was the truth? Well, to me, I think this is something that every witness has trouble with, but when it came to me, I truly believed what I preached, and I think many people do. It's why I put myself through so much unnecessary anxiety, trying to write up talks, to give in front of like over a hundred people, to go door to door and talk to strangers about what they believed was wrong, or why I studied for hours on end and made sure I was up to date with all the latest magazines and videos. I believed what I was teaching, but still always in the back of my head, there was this question, this unanswerable question that bothered me. How could I know for sure? Undoubtedly, like so many before and after me, Whenever I would bring it up with anyone with spiritual authority, they would simply say, I need more faith. I needed to not worry too much about the details and instead focus my attention on the work being done and how close we are to the end. All the rest would just be sorted out eventually, apparently. So to make myself feel better, I would look at the organization as a whole, at the worldwide brotherhood and see all of the cooperation. I'd point to that. I would point to the love we had as brothers and sisters and all of the work that was being accomplished in the field ministry worldwide, knowing that you know, it was impossible for this thing to happen on the outside. So I thought. But like before, once I gave myself the permission to look outside, I saw so many irregularities. I realized the way I was living my life, the routine, the rules, the policies I was following were not because I believed them, but because that's what I was told to do. For instance, why was I supposed to do a minimum of 10 hours of field service when Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, verses 3 and 4, But you, when making gifts of mercy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your gifts of mercy may be secret. Then your Father who looks on in secret will repay you. Pretty self-explanatory. Why did I not celebrate birthdays? Was it because I truly believed they were evil or simply because the organization said they were? Doing some research in older watchtowers, you may find gems. Like this one from a 1971 Awake, the June edition, pages 20 through 24, under the subheading, Religious Connections. When speaking about piñatas, the Awake uh, had this to say. Catholic teachers employed piñatas in giving the Indian natives religious instruction. Piñatas also came to be used in connection with Christmas. Nowadays, the posada in Mexico features disorder, drunkenness, and criminal activity. The celebrations are used as an excuse for wild and immoral living. Today, however, many give little thought to the religious aspects of Posada and the breaking of the piñata. And then later on, as a follow-up in the 2003 Awake September edition, pages 23 and 24, they updated with this. When considering whether to include a piñata at a social gathering, Christians should be sensitive to the conscience of others. A main concern is not what the practice meant hundreds of years ago, but how it is viewed today in your area. Understandably, opinions may vary from one place to another. Hence, it is wise to avoid turning such matters into big issues. So in simple terms, they say using piñatas in a modern day is more of a conscious matter since hardly does anyone give any thought to the pagan undertones of the past. This is also the same case when it comes to wedding rings, anniversaries, and you know other major celebrations with pagan backgrounds. But since witnesses love to say it's about principles rather than rules, wouldn't you say that this principle applies perfectly to the custom of celebrating birthdays? As a kid, I was told they were wrong to celebrate because the only two instances in the Bible where they were mentioned, bad things happened. However, 
in a modern day setting, I don't think a single person alive on this planet celebrates a birthday because they're keeping alive a pagan tradition meant to cause harm to others. Instead, they celebrate a person's life and the people around them spend time to show their appreciation for them. But you'll find no such article when it comes to birthdays as we just read about piñatas in JW Publications. Seems a bit strange, right? So then, who are the ones making up these rules? As a witness, I knew them to be the faithful and discreet slave, a group of people who are part of the 144,000 who are given the task of dispensing spiritual food to God's people. This group has changed over the years, including how it's functioned. But in the last 10 years or so, a new understanding has come about where in only the members of the governing body and its writing and teaching team can be called the faithful slave. Then these men are the one who decide all of the policies and rules within the organization worldwide. They are the only channel through which to receive spiritual food and direction. It says so in their own magazines. If that's the case, then why did the governing body member Jeffrey Jackson say this? Does the governing body, or do the members of the governing body, um, do you see yourselves as modern-day disciples, the modern-day equivalent of Jesus' disciples? Uh, we certainly hope to follow Jesus and be his disciples. And do you see yourselves as Jehovah God's spokespeople on earth? Uh, that, I think, would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that... Uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Oh, that's right. He was subpoenaed by the Australian Royal Commission in 2015 to testify about his role and how the congregations are supposed to report child sex abuse and how pedophiles are dealt with. But how would any witness know about these events when we're told to avoid negative information and see it only as Satan's propaganda? Seems a bit odd, doesn't it? But going back to what he said, if you were on trial, and being told to defend your faith, to make a stand for your faith, you wouldn't say it the way he did. You would stand up firmly and say, the governing body is the only means by which Jehovah communicates to us today, since they are the faithful and discreet slave. Right? I mean, it says so in the magazine. Yet one of those members, as a representative of that group, did not even come close to saying that. Now, listen to this. Sure, what you need to understand with regard to our organization is a faith driven organization. It, this is uh, not an organization of lawyers or those that are uh, overly concerned with legal matters. So our primary allegiance is to Jehovah God. Now the governing body realizes that if we were to give some direction that is not in harmony with uh, God's word, uh, all of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide who have the Bible would notice that and they would see that this wrong direction. We are firmly aware that witnesses obey whatever is printed in the publications and follow it as law. A new understanding comes out, and you're told to fall in line. And yet here, Jeffrey Jackson says that everyone is a Bible reader in the organization, and so if the governing body were to say something off or weird, then they would get called out on it. Not true. So as a hypothetical, what would happen if you were to openly disagree with perhaps a new understanding of a doctrine? such as when they changed the meaning of the word generation when it came to the prophecy Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24, 33, 34. We know that you would be counseled with firm loving counsel. Now, what exactly is firm loving counsel even mean? Well, it honestly means fall in line or you'll be disfellowshipped. Oh, how do we know that's what would happen? Well, because it says so in the Shepherd the Flock of God book, meant only for elders. No ordinary publisher, pioneer, or member can have access to this book. It is here where all the rules are laid out, the rules that ordinary witnesses are supposed to be held accountable to. I'll post a link in the description down below so that anyone who's interested can read it, because it is fascinating to be able to know exactly what the rules are, even though I had been in the organization for 30 years and never knowing what was a uh, disfellowshipping offense, what was a reprove offense, any of that stuff. So it's really interesting to see. I'll post a link. So, now going back to the organization and those that are in charge. For witnesses, we've donated much of our time. Yes, but what about our resources? We are told over and over again, repeatedly through broadcasts, articles, and reminders that we need to donate towards uh, the cause with our valuable things. 
However, what they aren't telling you is about the sexual abuse uh, charges that were happening in Montana, in Southern California. Most recently, the Montana case where Watchtower had to pay the victims $35 million. Where do you think that money comes from? Bluntly, from the donations. From your hard-earned money, you are paying for the mistakes of those at the top who refuse to change their policies concerning the handling of child abuse among the congregations worldwide. Now think about the larger picture. How could people in the world even be drawn to Jehovah's Witnesses when they read in the news and see all these child abuse cases? The Montana case for one, the Australian Royal Commission for another, which in the end concluded that there were at least, at least 1,000 cases of sexual abuse that went unreported to the authorities. Why would someone on the outside read that article, then have a witness come to their door, and then want to join them? They wouldn't think how loving witnesses are. No, they would think that they are just like every other religion who has had this black eye of child abuse cover-up on their resume. Now, as active Jehovah's Witnesses, you could say there are a few bad apples, yes, and the organization is run by imperfect men, but with what we've been taught about how Holy Spirit works among the elder bodies and in the organizational matters, it's not possible for this type of criminal activity to be happening among Jehovah's Witnesses. Aren't elders and men of authority prayed over and asked through Holy Spirit to ensure they are capable of that position before they're even made elders? Isn't it like a spiritual background check where Jehovah checks that person, checks their credentials, their history, their past, their deepest anything, and gives them the A-OK -okay to give them that much responsibility over the flock? So why would God's Holy Spirit allow a child molester to become an elder unless there never was Holy Spirit to begin with? As always, it's something to think about. And finally, we've reached our final question. Again, the two-part one. What if you're wrong, and how would you even know? This is something that's going to be tough. How would you know you're wrong? Like, seriously, think about it. Is there any way a Jehovah's Witness can find out whether they are being lied to or misled? Any attempts by anyone who used to be a witness gets batted away as apostate material. You shouldn't listen to it. They're just angry and bitter. Any negative news reports are false. Like mentioned earlier, more of Satan's propaganda. So how can you personally know? Well, I mean, that's a personal question. It takes a lot of guts, believe me, to question that everything you've been taught since you were a child is a mere fantasy, a lie, constructed to keep you busy, thinking that the world is about to end with paradise ready to fix every single problem you have. In the end, the evidence against Jehovah's Witness teachings, the hypocrisy, the numerous accounts of people who have been wrongfully treated and then disregarded. There have even been major network television shows covering just how truly bad it is. I thought Jehovah's Witnesses were just nice people knocking on doors. We have received many letters. Please look into the Jehovah's Witnesses. Take Scientology, add 8 million members, and you've got Jehovah's Witnesses. It's the same formula, mind control. They believe that it'll get fixed internally. We owe the people who have asked for our help to actually do something. And yet I, we, never knew anything about how bad it really was. The evidence is unsurmountable. There's even a movie that came out last year that dealt with the very real ramifications when someone gets disfellowshipped and how the policies drawn up by the Watchtower can destroy families. You guys are Jehovah's Witnesses. You never said. God is going to restore Earth back to paradise, how he intended it to be. I just don't want to know all that. Who's the father? It's a guy from college. I need you to start bringing him to meetings. It's not going to happen. What should I do? You must keep any necessary contact to a bare minimum. One more announcement this week. Louisa Whitling is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're not going to say anything? I'm Stephen. I'm a new elder here, serving where the need is great. Now people say things about us. People are bitter. Some brothers believed Armageddon was supposed to come in 1975. It's okay to have doubts. Is it okay if I start to help her now just with a few practical things? We must avoid socializing with the wrongdoer. What's the problem? She likes to voice her own opinions too much. 
Do you know how it feels to think Jehovah is punishing you all the time? Do you think it's right how they make you treat me? You might beg Jehovah, why do this to me and my family? <laughs> Jesus stated that his work could cause conflict in the household. Mom, what are you doing? We must put Jehovah first, even before our family. <laughs> To say the least, that movie, Apostasy, was so intimate, touching, and real to life that I couldn't help but just feel and get so upset at how everyday people are told to stay away from family members just because they don't believe the same thing anymore. So then, the big question comes up. What if you're wrong? What do you have to lose? I remember asking myself at least once a year that same question when I was in. And my answer was, well, even if in the end, let's say I'm 80 years old and uh, I find out it's all fake, you know, I'll, I think I would still be happy with my life since I was trying to help people. So, you know, I wouldn't feel too bad about it. But if you ask me that question now, it is wildly different. And I feel sorry for that past version of me who said that to begin with. We're going to start off with a little bit of math. Okay, real quick. Meetings are about two hours long. Right? Usually an hour and 45, but you get there, you get dressed, you drive there, all that prep, especially if you have responsibilities. So let's say two hours. You know, we have two meetings a week. There are 52 weeks. That totals up to 208 hours per year in meetings alone. Now, field service. Let's say you average only about 10 hours, you know, like the minimum. You multiply that by 12 for each month, and that ends up being about 120 hours per year. You know, now, for conventions, you know, we travel, you know, we prep for them, we get food, we have the whole thing, for there's a whole shindig for it, right? And we attend three convention days per year in the summer, usually, and two single-day assemblies every year. So that's five days, right? And with all the time that it takes to travel to them, prep the food, get back home, do volunteer work if you're, you know, cleaning, cleaning up after the bathrooms, whatever, or plus the time, you know, you're sitting down listening to it, or if you're participating in the program, you know, whether you have a talk or whether you're volunteering, you know, to give an experience, I'd say those days are at least eight to 10 hours per day. So multiply that by the five days, and you've got 50 hours per year. Okay, studying, now that's a lot of time, right? Let's say one hour for the watchtower and prepping for service, and another hour for prep, uh, preparing for the midweek meeting plus parts you might have on that meeting. Uh, multiply that by 52 weeks and that's 104 hours per year. So total all those numbers up and you have sacrificed 482 hours per year or the equivalent of 20 straight days without sleeping doing just the minimum for the organization. Now, let's say you're a pioneer. Let's say you're a pioneer for 10 years, okay? That then adds up to 8,400 hours or 200 straight days. And that's not including Bible studies, construction projects if you're part of that work, or if you, you know, you're going out and giving talks or doing shepherding calls, any of that, if you're a ministerial servant or an elder. That's 200 straight days of no sleep, simply serving an organization and doing absolutely nothing for the betterment of yourself. To put that into perspective, the average amount of clinical hours to become a nurse practitioner in the United States is a little over 400 hours. That is something to ponder over. How witnesses could better spend their time actually helping people practically and also growing individually you know, I have a friend who's been a pioneer for years. She's a little younger than me, but she's traveled the world and pioneering, volunteering, giving of her time, all of that. She's a sweet girl, incredibly smart and studious, outgoing, just great person. She could literally do anything, and yet she's given her youth and realistically her entire life and future to the organization. I have another friend who could literally do anything. He was always so enthusiastic to go on new adventures, to, to try new things, to be a better dude at all times. He and I were best friends. But what will he gain if in 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, the end of the system has yet to come and everything we ever did in service of preaching that kingdom was for nothing? In the end, what was it all for? We would have given up time, family, goals, life, and for what? because we simply didn't research or look into what we actually believed? What did I have to lose? My entire life. It would be a sad thing if my friends were to continue down this path, never having the bravery to think they might have been misled, only to fall into the same trap watchtower laid for millions of kids before us. This is from an Awake, a 1969 Awake. It's gonna be the May edition 
uh, May 22nd edition, page 15, and it reads, If you are a young person, you also need to face the fact that you will never grow up old in this present system of things. Why not? Because all the evidence and fulfillment of Bible prophecy indicates that this corrupt system is due to end in a few years. Of the generation that observed the beginning of the last days in 1914, Jesus foretold, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. Therefore, as a young person, you will never fulfill any career that this system offers. If you're in high school and thinking about a college education, it means at least four, perhaps six or eight more years to graduate into a specialized career. But where will this system of things be by that time? It will be well on the way toward its finish, if not actually gone. Okay. Those were kids in 1969. We are now 50 years in the future, and all those kids grew up and gave up on their dreams, maybe possibly even giving up families to stay single, who will never have a chance to have children, live up to their potential, follow their dreams. If we keep listening to what Watchtower says, their clarifications, their new light, as they call it, then where will we be in 50 years? I like to think that by that time, we would still be friends, living full lives, doing what we want to do, and achieving every dream we ever had without anyone telling us what to do. Either you have the truth or you don't. But what I've learned since I've left and stopped being a Jehovah's Witness is that no one has the truth. There is no one truth for everyone. If God truly wanted everyone to live, he would just make it so. There wouldn't need to be rules, policies, regulations to test who among us is worthy of life. I'm not telling you what to believe and what not to believe, but what I'm telling you is to be honest with yourself, to question everything. Because if Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth, then you've lost nothing by examining what you believe. But if you take the time to really look into what you believe, not what others are saying, not what I'm saying, but to truly look at your own beliefs, then you just might have everything to lose. Anyway, I know this video was incredibly long. It took forever to put together, but I hope it can do some good. I'm not sure I'll do any more videos from this point on, sadly, but uh, I feel happy now uh, where I'm at in life. Um, much of my uh, J-Dub lifestyle is now behind me, a lot of those thoughts. Um, I mean, it still comes up uh, here and there, but for the most part, I feel like I've been able to move on. I hope my previous videos can be of help to others as they discover, you know, that there's life after the Watchtower. And so, you know, I thank everyone. I thank you for all the encouragement, uh, the kind words, the comments, uh, everyone who watched, everyone who liked, everyone who shared. Um, I appreciate all of it. And my sincerest hope is that all of you live honestly and live true to yourselves. Thank you.